Welcome to the Books Radar channel, where we summarize the essence content of best-selling books, helping you quickly grasp the book's core insight and save valuable time. Today, I'm going to interpret a book called, Chip War, with the subtitle, The Battle for the World's Most Critical Technology. This is a new book published in October 2022, and it delves into a topic that has been of concern to people in recent years, the competition between the United States and other countries in the field of semiconductors or chips. In recent years, the competition around chips between China and the United States has intensified, with the United States imposing various restrictions on the export of high-end chips to China. We often see related news about this. However, if we dig deeper, we will find that there are many aspects of this chip competition that we may not fully understand. The author of this book, Chris Miller, is an associate professor of international history at Tufts University in the United States. He is also a researcher at a U.S. think tank and a contributor to the New York Times. He has conducted extensive research, interviewed over 100 chip experts from industry, academia, and government, and ultimately wrote this book. The book's story is full of twists and turns, with fierce competition between countries and the United States in the field of chips over the past few decades. Regardless of success or failure, it provides insights into understanding the Sino-US chip competition. To make it easier for you to understand the essence of this book, I have divided the key content into four parts. Each part tells a real historical story and corresponds to a major competitor of the United States in the chip field. Part 1. Before we start the story, we need a bit of background information. Because without understanding the basics of chips, we won't know what everyone is competing for in the story. But don't worry, I won't use complex formulas. In simple terms, what is a chip, and why is it essential? So what is a chip? In the simplest terms, a chip is essentially a circuit. In the age of electricity and information, circuits are the foundation of everything. In the past, circuits relied on mechanical components for control, like the light switches we still use today. However, in 1945, a scientist named Shockley at Bell Labs accidentally discovered semiconductors. He found that semiconductors had a magical property, changing voltage could turn them on and off, much like a switch. In other words, with semiconductors, people could control electricity using electricity. The on and off states of electricity represent 0 and 1, enabling various calculations. This is the foundation of today's computers, the internet, smartphones, and all kinds of electronic devices and smart gadgets. The more semiconductor components you have on a circuit, the more powerful the circuit's capabilities. The problem is that all these components need to be soldered onto a circuit board and connected with wires, which can be very complicated. If you've ever disassembled an old radio or TV, you've seen the circuit boards inside, and you know how complex they can be. Manufacturing circuits like this is cumbersome, consumes a lot of power, and is prone to malfunctions. At this point, Shockley had a young genius with a brilliant idea, since the core of these circuits is semiconductor, could we directly carve the components on a semiconductor material? It turned out that this idea was feasible, and it could make components very small, allowing for more complex circuits. Previously, circuits soldered onto boards might contain a few hundred components, but with this technology, circuits etched onto semiconductors could accommodate tens of thousands or even millions of components, enabling more complex calculations. The development of information technology today is fundamentally driven by the fact that the same sized circuit can accommodate more semiconductor components. These circuits etched onto semiconductors are called integrated circuits, or commonly known as chips. Next, when I tell this story, I'll use the term chips for convenience. Now we can officially start the story. Where does the story begin? It begins on a seemingly ordinary winter night over 60 years ago in Washington. In the winter of 1958, on the streets of Washington, three young men went out for drinks, humming songs and walking back to their hotel through the snow. People passing by them on the street would never have imagined that these individuals would become future tech giants with the power to change the world. Among these three young men was the famous Gordon Moore, yes, the one who proposed Moore's Law. Another young man was Robert Noyce, the brilliant young inventor we mentioned earlier, who would become the co-founder of Intel with Moore a decade later.
Then there was a Chinese-American scientist named Zhang Zhongmo. You might not be familiar with this name, but in the story that follows, he will play a very important role. The book, Chip War, uses this moment as the beginning of the story, and the timing is excellent. Because at this time, the chip, as an invention, had already been validated by science and technology. However, the chip had not yet formed an industry because it still needed to pass the test of commerce. Today, we all know the importance of chips, but looking back at that time, this new invention seemed somewhat impractical because at the time, the cost of etching a circuit onto a semiconductor was 50 times that of soldering it onto a circuit board. Moore and Noyce saw the tremendous potential of chips, so they gathered others to establish Fairchild Semiconductor. This company later became very famous and can be said to be the birth of Silicon Valley. However, at that time, this newly established company was in a dire situation because no one in the market was willing to foot the bill for this expensive new invention. The market needed a large order to kickstart this cycle. Surprisingly, the first major order received by Fairchild came from the Soviet Union. In 1957, the Soviet Union successfully launched the world's first artificial satellite. For years later, Soviet cosmonaut Yuri Gagarin became the first human in space. The Soviet Union's achievements had shaken the United States, which had always considered itself a superpower in technology. The US government urgently launched a space program, announcing its intention to send astronauts to the moon. Such a space program, of course, required rockets, and using chips to control rockets made them lighter and more energy efficient than traditional circuits. The space program prioritized performance over cost, and this presented a significant business opportunity for Fairchild Semiconductor. On the other hand, the US military also began purchasing chips. During the Cold War, the US military planned to develop a missile that could launch nuclear warheads into space to strike the Soviet Union. The problem was that the missile required precise guidance, and the computers on board were too bulky and heavy, which affected the missile's performance. If chips were used for the onboard computers, performance could be doubled while the weight was halved. Similarly, the military valued performance more and was willing to pay for high-performance chips. As a result, NASA and the US military became the first major customers of the chip industry. Later on, the military's demand for chips grew significantly. Satellites, sonar systems, torpedoes, radar, and various weapons began using chips. In the 1960s, over 95% of the chips produced in the United States were used in military and aerospace applications. In just two years, Fairchild's sales skyrocketed from $500,000 to $21 million, and it grew into a large company with 1,000 employees. With the first influx of funds, the virtuous cycle we mentioned earlier began to turn. The cost of chips started to decrease, and in less than 10 years, the selling price of Fairchild chips dropped from $20 to $2. Consequently, the civilian market opened up, and various manufacturers began purchasing chips. Especially in the field of computers, chips enabled computers to be more powerful while occupying less space, allowing them to enter companies and even households. This further expanded the market for chips. At the time, one computer company purchased 20 million chips in a year, more than 20 times the number used in the Lunar program. By the late 1960s, the number of chips purchased by the civilian computer industry had caught up with the military, and demand in the civilian sector was still growing. The chip industry had become red-hot, akin to a massive gold mine. When an employee of Fairchild left the company, he wrote candidly on the company's exit survey, I want to get rich. The influx of substantial funds allowed the chip industry to accelerate its development. Part 2. However, in such a critical field that concerns both national security and substantial financial interests, it was inevitable that the United States wouldn't remain the sole dominant player for long. So, the first competitor had already taken a seat opposite the United States. This competitor was none other than the Soviet Union. The Soviets quickly recognized the significance of chips in defense and aerospace, and they decided to develop their own semiconductor industry. The Soviet Union even built a city on the outskirts of Moscow dedicated to semiconductor research and development. This city had specialized universities, laboratories, factories, and amenities like hospitals, kindergartens, and cinemas for its workforce.
The Soviets were ambitious, and they didn't aim to become a second Silicon Valley, they believed that the Soviet semiconductor industry would far surpass that of the United States. It wasn't just Soviet optimism. If we look back at the time, it would seem that the Soviet Union had the capability to compete with, and even surpass, the United States in the semiconductor field. First, in terms of research capabilities, the founding figure of the semiconductor field, Shockley, later became a professor at Stanford University and published a textbook, which was quickly translated into Russian. The Soviet Union had world-class physicists at the time, and it can be said that Soviet research in the field of semiconductors was almost synchronous with that of the United States. Secondly, regarding intelligence, the Soviet consulate in San Francisco once had a team of 60 special agents solely responsible for gathering technological intelligence from Silicon Valley companies. These agents would recruit American technical personnel, use shell companies in Switzerland to import chips, and even infiltrate Intel factories for theft. In essence, the Soviets were always able to obtain the latest American chips through various means. From this perspective, it might appear that the Soviet Union had the resources, the funds, and the intelligence needed to compete with and potentially surpass the United States in the semiconductor field. However, in 1985, the Central Intelligence Agency CIA, conducted research on Soviet chips and found that these Soviet replicas consistently lagged behind the United States by five years, not faster, not slower, but precisely five years behind, like clockwork. Why could the Soviet Union only follow in the United States' footsteps? The book analyzes various reasons, but the primary one may be that Soviet scientists and engineers had no room for independent innovation, they were handcuffed. The Soviet strategy in the semiconductor field was to replicate. The orders from above were to replicate American chips exactly as they were produced in the United States. Whatever the Americans did, the Soviets did the same. Even the units of measurement were identical, if the Americans used inches, the Soviets used inches too. This approach ensured minimal room for error, but it also meant that the Soviet Union was essentially following the United States step by step, whether the United States went straight or made a turn. This approach essentially eliminated any possibility of surpassing the United States. Another limiting factor was that almost all Soviet chips were delivered to the military, with little development in the civilian market. As you heard from the previous part of the story, the mature American chip market had two legs, military and civilian. As time went on, the civilian consumer market became the dominant leg. However, the Soviet Union had almost no consumer market and was overly reliant on military customers. In the race, the Soviet Union was essentially trying to catch up with the United States on one leg, and it became increasingly challenging. In 1990, the last Soviet leader, Mikhail Gorbachev, visited Silicon Valley and said to the audience during a speech at Stanford University, the Cold War is over, and we shouldn't argue about who won. But that was just his rhetoric. In the following years, the once promising Soviet chip factories dwindled to the point where they could only produce small chips for McDonald's toys. The outcome of the chip war between the Soviet Union and the United States was clear. The repercussions of this chip competition continued until the 2022 Russia-Ukraine conflict. With the end of the Cold War, most Russian customers ceased to purchase domestically manufactured chips, and the Russian chip industry declined significantly. On the Ukraine battlefield, people discovered that Russian drones predominantly used foreign chips. As for more critical weapons, such as precision-guided missiles, they became difficult to produce because of chip shortages. Due to chip restrictions from the United States and Europe, Russia faced a missile shortage within a few weeks of the conflict starting. The book cites a report from U.S. intelligence agencies, revealing that Russian factories even disassembled chips from dishwashers to use in missile systems. This illustrates just how dire the situation became for Russian chip production when faced with chip restrictions. Part 3. However, the Soviet Union's withdrawal did not put the United States completely at ease. They discovered that another challenger had emerged, and this challenger was Japan. Japan's challenge was different from that of the Soviet Union. While the Soviet Union initially aimed to directly compete with the United States, Japan began by aligning itself with the United States and sought to integrate into America's semiconductor industry network. 
Let's take the example of a Japanese company, the renowned Sony Corporation. Sony's founder, Akio Morita, recognized the immense potential of semiconductors as early as 1948. When semiconductor technology emerged, Sony quickly embraced it. However, Sony did not pursue defense or aerospace contracts, instead, they focused on integrating chips into consumer products like radios and calculators. The United States considered Japan a strategic and economic ally, so it didn't impose barriers on Japan's semiconductor industry. In fact, it granted early authorization to companies like Sony. However, Sony could only produce chips that lagged behind the latest generation, and they diligently paid patent royalties to the United States. At this point, a symbiotic relationship had formed between the United States and Japan in the semiconductor field. The United States produced the most advanced chips, while Japan focused on manufacturing slightly older generation chips. The United States had the military market, and Japan concentrated on the civilian consumer market. On the surface, Japan seemed to be running this race with only one leg, consumer market demand. However, the issue was that this consumer market was growing rapidly, making Japan's single leg increasingly robust. For example, Intel developed a type of DRAM, Dynamic Random Access Memory, chip, which we commonly refer to as memory chips. When you buy a computer or a smartphone and see specifications like 8GB or 16GB of memory, you're looking at DROM chips. The demand for DROM chips in the market, even just in the personal computer sector, was staggering. Initially, American-made DROM chips dominated the market because Intel invented them. Japan began producing DROM chips but could only secure a portion of the lower-end market. Back then, in the eyes of the United States, made in Japan was often synonymous with cheap and low-quality products. However, by the 1980s, a high-ranking executive in the American semiconductor industry conducted a survey and found that the quality of Japanese chips had surpassed that of American chips. He compared chips from three Japanese companies with chips from three American companies and compiled data on chip failure rates. He discovered that even the best American company had a failure rate more than four times higher than that of the Japanese companies, while the worst American company had a failure rate over ten times higher. This meant that Japanese chips were not only cheaper but also more reliable. So why would anyone choose American chips? Moreover, Japanese companies had more significant ambitions. They realized that merely replicating American products would only result in second-tier status and profits. To gain more, they needed to create entirely new products. Sony's Walkman, a portable cassette player, became a prime example, selling a total of 385 million units globally and becoming one of the most popular consumer products in history. Each Walkman contained five state-of-the-art chips, and these new products generated new demands, driving Japan's semiconductor industry. By the 1980s, consumer electronics had become Japan's specialty, turning Japan into a major player in the semiconductor industry, with hints of potentially surpassing the United States. Intel, which had pioneered the DROM chip, saw its global market share shrink to a mere 1.7% at one point. By 1990, half of the world's chip manufacturing factories were owned by Japanese companies. While Japan had only one leg in the race, the consumer market, this leg was becoming increasingly strong. In contrast, the United States, which had two legs, military and consumer markets, saw its consumer market leg growing weaker. At this point, Japan couldn't help but wonder if it could surpass the United States. Sony's founder, Akio Morita, even wrote a book titled, The Japan That Can Say No, which argued that Japan was no longer reliant on the United States but that the United States was increasingly reliant on Japan. This infuriated the United States, and they decided to retaliate. In the low-end chip market, the United States chose to befriend South Korea. At the time, the South Korean government provided substantial loans to Samsung to help develop its semiconductor industry. The rise of South Korea was sure to shake Japan's position. The Americans believed that the enemy of their enemy was their friend, so by supporting South Korea, they indirectly transferred semiconductor manufacturing technology to them. Intel even allowed Samsung to label their chips as Intel products. By 1998, South Korea's memory chip production surpassed Japan's, causing Japan's market share to plummet from 90% to 20%.
Furthermore, the United States once again took the lead in high-end chip technology. One notable example was Intel's transformation. At the time, Intel's CEO was Andy Grove, who later authored the famous book Only the Paranoid Survive. Grove recognized that Intel was likely losing in the memory chip business to Japan. He wanted to shift Intel's focus to CPUs, central processing units, but while the memory business was profitable in the short term, the future of CPUs was uncertain. So, Grove had a famous conversation with Gordon Moore, where he asked what would happen if they were both fired, and a new CEO took over. Moore believed that the new CEO would abandon the memory business and concentrate on CPU research and development. Grove ultimately made the decision to oversee this transformation himself. The results are well known, Intel made the right bet. Computers became ubiquitous, and nearly every computer had an Intel CPU. Intel not only revived but also reasserted the United States' leadership in the semiconductor industry. Additionally, the U.S. military continuously supported semiconductor innovation with significant investments. One notable development was a new method for chip design. In the early days of chip design, engineers drew layouts with colored pencils. However, as chips became more complex, manual design became increasingly challenging. Two computer scientists devised a method for designing integrated circuits using software. With sponsorship from the military, this method matured and gave rise to a new industry of software tools for chip design. This innovation had a profound and lasting impact. Today, anyone designing chips still relies on American design software. In summary, through innovation, the United States once again gained a leading position. Japan realized that its market position was not irreplaceable, and in the battle of give and take, Japan's challenge ultimately ended in failure. Part 4. Lastly, let's talk about China. As we mentioned earlier, the semiconductor industry walks on two legs, defense and civilian markets. China started its semiconductor research and development back in the 1960s and could independently produce core-level chips for defense applications. However, in the civilian market, especially in consumer electronics, China initially lagged behind, even in the Asian semiconductor arena. In the 1980s, many Asian countries sought to establish themselves in the semiconductor market. Japan and South Korea were the most successful, followed by Singapore and Malaysia, which were learning from South Korea, transitioning from chip assembly to independent chip manufacturing. China, at that time, was further behind. China needed to rely on Taiwan for chip packaging and testing, which were at the lowest end of the semiconductor industry and had lower technological requirements, primarily labor-intensive tasks. Mainland China had just initiated economic reforms and opening up policies. Even if they ventured into the semiconductor industry, they had to follow Taiwan's model. However, there was one individual who completely changed this landscape, Morris Chong. Born in mainland China, raised in Hong Kong, and educated in the United States, he attended both Harvard University and later transferred to the Massachusetts Institute of Technology, MIT. Like Moore and Noyce, he was one of the earliest participants in the semiconductor industry. Moreover, he possessed both technical expertise and managerial skills. In the 1980s, Taiwan invited Morris Chang to help upgrade the island's semiconductor industry. Morris Chang founded the renowned TSMC, Taiwan Semiconductor Manufacturing Company, and developed an unprecedented industry model. What was this model? In the past, each company in the semiconductor industry had its chip fabrication facility, doing both design and manufacturing in-house. At most, large American companies would place factories in Southeast Asia to save on labor costs. However, Morris Chong believed this was inefficient. He used an analogy, it was like every author having their own printing press. The burden was too significant. Instead, he proposed a model where there would be dedicated chip fabrication facilities that would manufacture chips based on designs provided by others. At that time, some smaller companies were already thinking about focusing solely on chip design and outsourcing manufacturing to big foundries like Intel. However, this approach didn't work well as large foundries considered these orders too small to be their focus, and smaller companies were worried about their designs being copied. When TSMC started operations, this Fables business model for semiconductor production truly took off.
Previously, chip manufacturing was a capital-intensive business, but now, it was possible to design chips without the high upfront costs. Silicon Valley saw a surge in startup companies, and creativity in the semiconductor industry was reinvigorated. Among these smaller companies was NVIDIA, initially making graphics cards and later evolving them into GPUs, graphics processing units. With the rise of artificial intelligence, it was discovered that GPUs were particularly suited for training AI models. As a result, NVIDIA gained more attention. The founder of NVIDIA once said, if I had to build a factory to produce GPU chips myself, I might be the CEO of a company worth only tens of millions of dollars today. While that may sound like a lot, you should know that NVIDIA's current market capitalization is in the hundreds of billions of dollars. Additionally, Apple, a giant in the tech industry, has long been one of TSMC's most prominent customers. Furthermore, Morris Chang did two things to solidify his position in the industry. Firstly, TSMC firmly decided not to engage in chip design, ensuring that customers could confidently entrust their designs to TSMC. Secondly, TSMC formed a broad alliance with partners across the industry chain, including chip design companies, lithography machine manufacturers, and semiconductor material suppliers. This extensive alliance ensured that TSMC consistently had access to the most advanced chip manufacturing technology, reduced production costs, and made more companies willing to entrust their chip production to TSMC. The U.S. semiconductor manufacturing industry quickly declined, and by the 1990s, only Intel remained as a major chip manufacturer in the United States. Mainland China also followed a similar path, with SMIC, Semiconductor Manufacturing International Corporation, established around 2000, learning from TSMC's model. In theory, China and the United States, in the semiconductor field, should be more interdependent. Both design and manufacturing, and both countries benefit from this collaboration. From the U.S. perspective, having access to an additional consumer market, especially one as massive as China's, means more revenue. Having more chip manufacturers also acts as a safeguard against potential price hikes by companies like TSMC. Since the semiconductor industry is global, having more players involved should be advantageous for the United States. So why does the U.S. harbor such great hostility toward China in the semiconductor domain? The book provides a straightforward answer. Despite various reasons given by the US, the core reason is that China's progress in semiconductors has been too rapid, causing the US to perceive it as a threat. The US believes that if China's electronics industry continues to advance, and if China imports more high-end chips, the global semiconductor industry will become increasingly dependent on China. Now, as we reach the end of this book, you might feel that it leaves you with some unanswered questions. The author concludes with a question rather than providing a definitive answer, how would China break through in the semiconductor industry? Do you already have your own answers to these questions? Feel free to share your thoughts in the comments section below and engage in discussions with fellow listeners. The end. If you found this video helpful, please consider liking and subscribing to my channel. Your support keeps me motivated to create more valuable content. Thanks for listening. See you in the next video.